I think that we're going to switch to English, right? So thank you to the foundation. Thank you, Maria. And we switch to English. Um, and uh, let me start uh, not with superabundance, but with abundance. Uh, and let me go back in time uh, to 1599. Uh, that year, at the very end of the 16th century, uh, the late scholastic Juan de Mariana uh, wrote the following. He said, and thus, man who act first uh, sorry, uh, and thus man who at first was deprived of everything is today surrounded by goods as a result of the effort made in society with others and has greater resources than all other animals. Yeah. Why do you think that this idea that Juan de Mariana wrote about, that Julian Simon wrote about, and that you, Marion, has been researching and writing about uh, is so counterintuitive because we have developed or rather we have evolved to be a zero-sum thinkers uh, when we lived in small bands of maybe 150 people or so and we lived like that for hundreds of thousands of years um, the the hunters who would slaughter an animal and bring it back to the tribe it had to be it had to be apportioned equally and to everyone and if Dedra got two pieces of the slaughtered mastodon then I had nothing to eat. And I think that we have evolved this uh, fundamental sense that if more people come to dinner, the slicer the pieces of the mastodon must get. Yeah, yeah. But humans doesn't, don't work like that. Humans, when they come to dinner, they bring with them maybe a potato salad, maybe <laughs> some jamon, iberico, <laughs> maybe they will bring a bottle of wine, and uh, before you know it, you have a feast. In other words, our pie, the mastodon, is not equal in size. It can grow. And the fundamental thing about human beings is that they don't come into the world with just an empty stomach, but also with a brain capable of coming up with new ideas and hands to put those ideas into practice. Yeah, as, as, as Adam Smith said, the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. So a large society has more people to trade with. So, so, so as a result, population growth in the modern world is good for us, not bad. So you, in, in which way do you think that more population is enriching and not impoverishing? More ideas. Here we have people with various ideas. We're very different. Everyone in this room is unique. Parentage, abilities, tastes. And if we converse with each other, talk, or trade with each other, we can, you know, I can learn from Ian, I can learn from, uh, uh, from, 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 from each of you. So, so there's, there's this tremendous, um, it's language that's the key. Without language, it's very hard to operate a large society. So the abundance that Juan de Mariana was speaking about was that kind of Smithian concept yeah, it of, was Smithian. of an enlargement of the market and more division of yeah. labor. Yeah. Um, but not necessarily of the big increase yeah. in the in abundance and prosperity that we've seen since Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, yeah. which is mostly what I think Marion's book is about. And it's certainly what my <coughs> books in the last 10 or 15 years have been about. When I mention Adam Smith, I always cross myself. I'm a Christian and <laughs> he's, he's my saint. And, but he didn't, he didn't get that point very mm -hmm. well because it hadn't happened yet. And then after 1776 or 1800, there was this whoosh, amazing increase. I mean, a factor of 25 or 30, sometimes 100. But critics would say, uh, yes, it might be true that, that we have grown that much and it's uh, almost miraculous. However, uh, the important thing is 
whether we are happier or not, whether we have better education or not, whether we have better health care or not. Um, Ian, you have been uh, doing um, studies, uh, indexes over the years and trying to <coughs> put together uh, those different variables. Uh, don't you think that they have those critics have some value or, or they are totally off one the, of the One of the things that we do at the Cato Institute is produce what we call the Human Freedom Index, which is a measure of economic, civil, and personal freedoms around the world. We look at 86 different indicators per country over the course of a couple of decades to get a sense of how free the globe is and how free countries are at the individual level. And you can really look at specific indicators of freedom, like freedom of speech or openness to trade and that kind of thing. And <clears throat> one of the things that we can establish by looking at the empirical uh, evidence is the relationship between freedom and indicators of human well-being. And the evidence really does speak with a single voice about that relationship. The more countries are free, the more prosperous they are the higher the levels of human well-being measured across virtually any indicator of, of human well-being. And so to get back to, to your question, what really matters is that background of policies, institutions, and even cultural values that are supportive of those policies and institutions of freedom. Yeah. It, is, it is when that freedom increases and when that liberal environment is created that you see this explosion in wealth that uh, Deirdre McCluskey has called the great enrichment that, that really has only happened uh, in the past several hundred years uh, yeah. and, and was of course preceded by thousands of years of stagnant yeah. Uh, growth. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and the change was came with in the in the 1700s with the coming of the the liberal idea in the old days of agriculture kings the the theory was kings always win women always lose <laughs> and liberalism said oh no 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 we're going to reverse that and that coming of of freedom we claim was what made for this explosion in innovation. Let, let's introduce another factor here. Let's introduce equality. Yeah, uh, yeah. Are freedom and equality contradictory terms, no. values? I don't think so. I, I, I certainly don't think so. I think that, look, I think that everyone in this room is a descendant of an unspeakably poor peasant. I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to insult you. My ancestors were Irish peasants. Yours were some other kind of peasant. I, I don't see any Habsburg chins here. There are no descendants here, I suppose, of the crowned heads of Europe. But here we are. And if we're, if we're dignified, we don't envy each other. Many of you speak English and Spanish, not me. I speak only English. It's pathetic. <laughs> Stupid. Right. So, so let's not envy each other. Let's enjoy each other's diversity and difference. Right? Um, so that makes us unequal in some way. Yeah. But the way that, uh, the way that liberals uh, believe in equality is equality under the law, equal treatment. Uh, but but it's more than that, and it's, as, as Deirdre has called, equality of permission, which you of can Of permission, which, can which is the same thing as equality under the law, or, or there are various other definitions, but equality of permission, not of, of opportunity. That's impossible. We're all very different, and that's okay. As St. Paul said, uh, for, for first, 1 Corinthians 12, we have varied gifts. And that's, that's not so bad if we're allowed to trade as, as he said. Equality is like ice cream. Uh, the first liter you eat, it's delicious. 
the second liter will uh, make you very sick and take you to the hospital. Um, but the third one will probably kill you. Yeah. And <laughs> that's the essence of equality. Equality yeah. before the law is absolutely fundamental and it is fully compatible with freedom. Um, equality of opportunity, very difficult to come by, impossible. I have an equal opportunity to win Wimbledon with Roger Federer, but it's always going to be Roger Federer. And then the last type of equality, equality of outcome, is the one that has resulted in 100 million dead bodies over the course of the 20th century. Sure. So if, if, we, if, we're, if we're, equality at the finish line, equality at the beginning are unattainable. But the, the, the equality of joining the race, however we start. So if you're a woman, you're allowed to be an airline pilot now, once you weren't. Uh, if, you're, if you're poor, like Andrew Carnegie, you can become a steel magnate. Let's go back to super, superabundance. Um, and over the years, we have had again and again uh, um, people, academics, saying that um, we are about to find ourselves in a Malthusian trap. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, except for very small periods and very specific places uh, on Earth, we haven't seen that. Uh, haven't. Why? Why, why is that? Um, well, because the more people you have, the more ideas you have. But more ideas are not enough. Most ideas that people have are terrible. And that is why you also <laughs> need the market to sort out bad ideas from good ideas. Yep. So superabundance really equals population times freedom. Mm -hmm. You start with human beings who have ideas, the market sorts out good from bad ideas, leading to inventions and innovations, some bad, some good. But at the end of the day, after those ideas are tested in the market, per Dedra Mikulski, what you end up with are useful innovations that improve productivity and therefore increase our standards of living. Sure. Sure, it's, it's, like, ordin it's like biological evolution. You know, most revisions in our genes are bad for us. This is well known. But some of them are good for us. And we end up with, uh, Im well, we, one can call it improvement or just change. But in our case, it's improvement. It makes us better off. Now look, I, I, I want to briefly go back to, to the question about happiness. Because we can't guarantee happiness. We can guarantee what you might call scope. The ability to do stuff. Go to university, fly to Disney World or something. Scope. But, you know, maybe, maybe our impoverished ancestors making $2 a day, imagine trying to get along in, in Madrid on $2 American a day. That's what, it's, that's what your ancestors lived on. Maybe they were happy. I don't think so, but they, maybe they were happy. Okay. But the, but, uh, but the, key, but the key here is, <clears throat> is the concept of freedom. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the liberalism that emerged uh, uh, a couple of hundred years ago that has really shaped the modern world and, yeah, yeah. and, and led to this explosion of wealth first in a part of Europe and then increasingly around the world and that is responsible for these dramatic increases in human well-being uh, that we've never seen uh, never before seen. in the history of the world Not even close. and and yet um, there is still the pessimistic outlook that things are getting worse contrary to the evidence and even more so and this is what I think is the novel claim of Marian Tupi's book Superabundance we are not running out of resources, and population growth is not a problem that is going to lead to a greater and greater scarcity of resources. Not only does his book challenge that with evidence and the, the empirical evidence, uh, but it makes an astounding <coughs> counterclaim that resources are becoming more abundant, not less, and that all of this has happened when there's been an explosion in population. 
why is that? And I think that that's, that's really a challenge to what everyone has been told for decades, uh, that uh, this freedom in the market economy called capitalism or the free market, uh, maybe it produces some good things, but in the end, it's bad, we have to consume less and so on. That's simply not the case because the evidence is pointing continuously in a different direction. And uh, I think part of Marion's claim is that it's not just population growth, the important uh, institutions and, and policies of freedom uh, are, are central to this, to this process. And it's a relatively new thing in the history of humanity. Um, and certainly, we would not want to undermine those policies and institutions if we get the story wrong. Correct. So superabundance ideas, what do, I, what do ideas mean? Uh, they mean creation of new knowledge. And knowledge has a peculiar property to it. The more knowledge you consume, the more you have. And once you understand that, you can appreciate how, after two centuries of economic growth, after 150 years of using fossil fuels, for example, today we have more known reserves of fossil fuels than we had at the start of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Now, the key to knowledge creation is twofold. One, you have to have a functioning market. Market is the only way that you can sort out between bad and good ideas. So the knowledge gets weeded out. You, you, you weed out the wheat from the chaff, right? It's only the, the market that can provide you with that new knowledge. But knowledge creation also requires a free society. Freedom to speak, freedom to publish, freedom to associate, and freedom to listen to other opinions. If you cannot hear what Deidre McCloskey has to say because she's been canceled, then you are not really free to think because you are not able to contend with her ideas and incorporate them from your own personal thinking. Slaves don't innovate. So it, you, you, you're just mentioning something I, I would love to talk about is cancel culture. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how did it happen that in uh, the universities of the country that has been blessed with the superabundance more than probably any other country in the world, uh, you have um, yeah, all th this new culture of canceling those ideas that do not match with whatever preconceived um, Well, you know, in, in a way, there's, there's always been that kind of cancel culture. In olden days, it was the church that enforced it, for instance. And I'm old enough to remember the McCarthy period in academic life in the United States. And there it was, the, the canceling was coming from the right. And uh, if uh, you were a Marxist, you were canceled. And now it's not the right or the left. It, it's 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 lots of people. But but yeah, it's the the canceling is coming from the left. The, uh, uh, part of the reason most analysts agree on is that um, there there has evolved a monoculture <laughs> yeah, within yeah. American universities. That's the problem. Whereby, uh, when when Dedra's father was the head of politics department at Harvard in the 1950s. You still had some conservatives and maybe one or two classical liberals and then a lot of leftists, um, but it wasn't a monoculture. Whereas over the last, certainly since uh, the fall of communism over the last 30 years, um, all the disappointed Marxists have uh, retreated into universities <laughs> and many of them were there, were there already and they have created basically an environment where they just speak to um, uh, one another. Yeah. Universities, interestingly enough, are not the places where you, well, let me put it this way. In Here. the 1930s, yes, in the 1930s, of course, it was the German universities which were the highest quality um, um, in, in the world. And uh, it was uh, the German students and professors that embraced National Socialism mm -hmm. and destroyed the country and the university in the process. Now it's coming from the left before it came from the right. But no, the universities, just because they are supposed to be the engines for generation of new knowledge and rationality, that doesn't mean that that has to happen. And what about degrowth? Um, how do you explain the fact that 
uh, in an era that can be described as a, the era of superabundance. Uh, we have right now in Spain, for example, several uh, comunidades autonomas, several states, where you have commissions about the problem of overpopulation and the need for degrowth. The, the, these people are way behind the scientific times. I think it's quite clear. Most economists, most serious people who think about this say that, uh, would, would agree, agree with Marion, that on the, con on the contrary, population growth is good for us. Um, that doesn't mean, by the way, that declining population will cause a disaster, it, because that's so far in the future that I don't think we need to be terribly concerned about it. But in any case, this obsession with zero sum is very deep in humans, um, as Ma Marion often argues. And uh, it's, it's, it's scientifically mistaken. Yeah, the public opinion and the media is 20, 30 years perhaps behind the curve yeah. in terms yeah. of the economics right. discipline, which Deder knows much better than I. But Nobel Prizes have been given to people who basically subscribe to this view. Yeah, yeah. Michael Kramer, uh, for example, in the early 90s, uh, then um, um, gosh, uh, Paul Roma, <laughs> uh, just a short while ago. Um, uh, economists agree that more people uh, produce more knowledge and therefore more innovation, so uh, that's not controversial. Paul was a student of mine. Is he really? Mm -hmm. Yep. Was he good? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is... Oh, one, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, this business about population and resources, that is going to be relevant in terms of public debate long time after population of the world plateaus and start, starts falling off, because as we grow older, uh, so, as we grow older, as we grow richer, uh, <laughs> and, and older, older, and older, <laughs> as we grow richer, uh, we will all be consuming much more resources. So, you know, how does population and and um, and resources, how do they interact, uh, is a relevant question, uh, and one that we really need to, uh, you know, be precise about and and fight the enemy, which is of course is a de uh, dehumanizing antinatalist cult of death. That's what defraud is. Um, liberalism. What do you think liberalism is best at among these three options? Number one, allocating resources. Number two, generating useful knowledge. Number three, spreading virtues. All three. <laughs> I'm an economist, but I'm not going to choose. <laughs> Don't you agree? Yes, of course, it's, it's, it's all three. Um, but we liberals have a challenge to convince people who are pessimistic about yeah. the world and believe in this uh, dark narrative of, of everything is getting worse, we're running out of things, um, that it's not that way. And so um, it is true that liberalism leads to more and better things. And um, that's a materialistic argument. And liberals are not uh, like Marxists. We're not materialists. What we care about is freedom. And I think that uh, just the psychology of an ordinary person is that they will be convinced when you speak to their hearts and not their minds that's only. Right. That's right. And, and there, uh, you know, I think that we, we have a, a task uh, to do. But I think that the focus, which is correct from the point of view of a liberal, is to emphasize uh, that what we are promoting is a just society, that what we are promoting is fairness, yep. because that's what people care about. I don't think that most people care about inequality if, uh, that, uh, if a person achieved greatness and even riches uh, through their own merits, like Messi becoming the most, uh, the best soccer player in the world and becoming rich about it. I don't think people are envious about that or upset about that. Or Steve Jobs, who uh, benefited so many people and became a billionaire. But they will be upset if uh, the result was rigged, if there was favoritism from government, if there's a perception that uh, people get rich because 
the rules of the game are somehow rigged and it's an unfair society. And so at the heart of, the, of liberalism is the claim that this is not only the best system that works, it's also the most ethical and moral system because yeah, it's is. based on voluntary exchange and anything that's peaceful. Yeah. It's based on persuasion and not force. It's based on the concept uh, that things are uh, mutual and uh, mutually agreed upon and not based on uh, coercive uh, constraint. That is really the, the, the heart of liberalism's claim, not that it works fabulously better than any other system, which it does. In fact, the most important claim of liberalism is that it's an ethical system yeah. and it's far superior to the alternatives. Yeah, I mean, look, we, 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 lots of people think I did when I was a Marxist that the government should come in and redistribute income and make things better for you and worse for you and so on and so forth. But then I finally realized when I started studying economics instead of just saying, oh, well, I know all about it, it's the, the market is the most altruistic system available. It's the most other-directed system you can think of. You think, now wait a second, perfect communism is the most other, no it's not. The most other-directed is that you make a new product, you try to, you, you sacrifice and work hard, and you, you give in exchange for someone else's hard-earned income that they've traded with someone else. The trading makes us all better off. It, every year in the United States, 30,000 new consumer packaged goods are introduced somewhere. Not all in the same store or they'd go bankrupt. But scattered around the country, 30,000 new, I don't know, dog treats. <laughs> whatever you want to name. And then the market selects, as Marion said, and out of that comes, um, I don't know, the cell phone. In 1968, uh, Paul Ehrlich published The Population Bomb. And um, later in, in 1972, if I'm, my memory is correct, uh, uh, the limits uh, growth was published. Um, and, and they had very s clear predictions about what was going to happen uh, with the resources, uh, with living standards. Um, have we learned something? Or what have we learned? Uh, and, and today we have um, similar um, forecast, uh, yeah, yeah. not, not <coughs> about the same specific uh, factors, but with similar worrying, um, yeah. at least worrying um, yeah, forecasts about 50 years from now, 100 years from now. Uh, what have we learned? What should we have learned from this experience? Well, one thing that we have learned, or maybe I should say relearn, is that uh, people who are screaming bloody murder, people who are screaming the world is coming to an end, are listened to much more than people who are claiming it is within our power to create a better world and everything might work out under the proper <coughs> conditions, such as conditions of freedom. There is a human psychology involved here. If you are, if I'm here claiming to you everything go is going to end next year, it makes me sound as though I care about you. Whereas if I come to you and say, everything is probably going to work out, yeah, you may perceive me as a salesman, mm -hmm. um, as somebody who is being glib, who doesn't really care about you. He's trying to sell you something, a sell you a yeah. product. Mm -hmm. The smiley salesman who is trying to convince you to buy a second-rate car or something like that, yeah, second-hand yeah, car. Yeah, right. so, um, so, so that's part of it. Uh, we listen to doom and gloom much more than we listen to um, people, rational optimists. Uh, we are not irrational optimists. I do not believe that everything has to work out. All I'm saying is that given human history and what we know about human history, having defeated famines, having defeated 
smallpox. We can do great things in the future. Yeah. Look, the, the um, institutions like the World Bank <coughs> estimate, make a guess, a reasonable guess, at how fast world real income will increase. And they say it's been increasing in the last 150 years <coughs> by about 2% a year. 2% a year. And they think that if we don't cause it to, if we, if we do it, if we don't wreck it with war and overregulation, it'll go on going at 2% a year. Well, that doesn't sound like very much, but at 2% a year by compound interest, in 100 years, we'll have eight times more income per head than we have now. Everyone on the globe will have an income higher than the Swiss earn now. It's a great optimistic prospect, but as, as Marion says, think, ah, oh, you're just a, you're just a, a salesperson for capitalism, the stupid word, capitalism. What would you say, if instead of this audience here, this distinguished audience, you would have children here, what would you tell them about these ideas you're discussing about? I would say be, be of good cheer, but many of our grandchildren are terrified. They're pessimistic because they've been told relentlessly, the world is coming to an end, the world is coming to an end and they won't have children as a result, and they're, they're oh, woe is me. It's uh, very dangerous. Because then they turn to fascism or communism. They turn to the other salesmen, and the other salesmen believe in coercion, not in trade. Uh, it's a very good question. And I don't have a good answer at all because I don't talk to children usually. <laughs> I talk to audiences like these. I don't know, maybe what I would say is, you know how mom and dad tell you about these monsters that live under the bed in order to make you do your homework? Consider the possibility that other people are telling you about monsters living somewhere else, yeah, yeah. living in the woods, chasing Greta Thunberg around. Um, um, Make up your own mind, uh, read more. Um, access to information is free. In your hand, you have the entirety of global knowledge. Type in child mortality and see what it was like 100 years ago and see what it is like now. Um, that's what I would probably say. Well, I do have children, and I have had this conversation oh, no, with them. No. And I use the work that uh, my colleague Marion and his team uh, put together on dozens and dozens and dozens of indicator of human progress, on infant mortality rates, on access to safe drinking water, on the decrease in violence, on the end of slavery, on environmental indicators, on the rapidity with which uh, vaccines are able to be developed today compared to just 10 or 20 years ago. Yeah. And, and you can graph all of this, and we've actually done that in a book that's called 10 Global Trends that shows in vi data, with data visualizations just this remarkable improvement across virtually any uh, indicator of human well-being that you can think of over the last 50 years, over the last 60 years, uh, over the last 100 years. What did I do with my children? I went through every page of that book <laughs> and we talked about it and I said, look, when things were this bad on uh, life expectancy, people died at age you know, 35 average in the world uh, not that long ago. This is the time when, it, when people were predicting that the world was going to get worse and worse. Turn the page, different graph, different topic. Look at how much this has improved. By the way, every point along this graph, which is uh, the dates, uh, you know, from decades ago to now, at every point people were saying things are getting worse. 
Yeah. It is common for people to make the claim that things are getting worse when things are getting better. Yeah, this yeah. is a constant in, in uh, yeah. human history. You can go back thousands of years and actually see Garth. claims that things are, are, are getting worse. Yeah. There, is, there is a psychology. There's a lot of reasons for that. Part of it is just as you grow older, your own life becomes more complicated and difficult than when you were <laughs> you know, a teenager or in your 20s and everything went, looked good. So uh, most of us can think back to when we were 20 years old and think, boy, that was a great time. The world, <laughs> the world was great then. And that's a, you know, that's a typical uh, sort of uh, confusion that's a psychological one that Steven Pinker, a psychologist at Harvard, identifies as one of the many re psychological reasons that people are pessimistic, even in the light of evidence that things actually are uh, getting better. Yeah. And, you know, there's not one answer to your question, but I do think that it helps to just look at the facts, because most people don't know the history of, no. you name it, uh, maternal mortality rates. They're not aware of that. It helps to know the facts. The That's not enough. You have to make further arguments, including uh, why this is happening and, and, and why it's a virtue to let people interact voluntarily with each other in order to achieve these gains. But it, it really uh, does help to at least get the facts right. The great Hans Rosling, the late, late lamented uh, Swedish professor of uh, public health, um, has wonderful uh, uh, lectures on this matter. Right? Uh, which make the same point. He has this very amusing story of when his grandmother got a washing machine. Now, the, the women here especially realize that their great grandmother spent Monday the whole day doing the washing, uh, uh, you know, wringing it, and oh my God, it was hard work. And, um, when, when, her, when his uh, grandmother got a washing machine, the first time she used it, she just sat there and watched it for its whole cycle. She was so amazed. She just said, oh, oh, oh yeah, oh, the spin cycle, oh, oh. It was wonderful. My, one of my great-grandmothers died in childbirth. One of my great-great-grandmothers died in childbirth. Commonplace. Now rare. One last thing. Ian's story sort of reminds us all of the importance of parents in the upbringing of their children. If you want to have a happy and well-adjusted child, you simply cannot assume that they are getting uh, the correct information at school. No, um, and thankfully, today, there are plenty of books which are accessible to children across the age spectrum where they can learn about just the basic facts about the improving state of the world. Yeah, yeah. that's true. You speak about data. Uh, what about narrative? Um, and, and I'm asking this because um, I, I noticed that you didn't mention, we've been talking for what? 45 minutes, and you didn't mention the word capitalism one single time. I hate the word. Oh, you hate the word. So uh, It's a stupid word. T tell me more about that. But uh, it, it looks like language matters and narrative matters. Language matters tremendously. I, I'm a student of this. I, I was a professor of English, actually, for a while. Um, and I, I studied um, Greek and Roman uh, uh, rhetoric. And language is where the action is. If you, if, uh, uh, you c if you convince people that the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggle, for instance, it's very easy to believe what Marx says. So, you know, language matters. Um, the, I, I don't like the word capitalism because it suggests that capital piling up is what made us rich. And that's, that's not true. What made us rich is what we've been talking about, creativity coming from, from liberty. It's innovation, it's ideas. It's new, look, a famous, a wonderful example 
is the invention of the modern university by von Humboldt at the University of Berlin in 1810, and I'm a likely source. What he, his idea was to combine teaching of what we already know with the creation of new knowledge. And surprisingly, this was a new idea in the West. And now every respectable university follows the fun Humboldt idea. It was just an idea. Of course, narrative matters. And every theory and every sort of school of thought has its own uh, narrative. The grand narrative of liberalism is that it created vast prosperity and improvements in human well-being like the world has never seen before. And the central place of the dignity of the individual in all of this. That's yeah. the grand narrative yeah, yeah. of liberalism. And it contrasts with, the, obviously, with the grand narrative of, say, Marxism, which is about class struggle, and with other uh, grand narratives. Uh, you know, postmodernism, uh, at least in some variants, says that it's all about power structures. Yeah, yeah. And those are also defined by group identities. And yeah, yeah. there is a sort of uh, group or racial reductionism uh, yeah. that defines uh, power, those power struggles as the most important uh, ways to understand society. So it doesn't matter whether you're a successful entrepreneur serving customers, if you're an owner and uh, your customer is uh, a woman or of a different race, this is a power struggle and there is a power imbalance. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that actually, um, once uh, communism collapsed and was seen as a failure, yeah, yeah. Uh, that ideology, which had been already uh, bubbling by some intellectuals in, in Europe and in the United States, was what really started to predominate more in the thinking and teaching at, at colleges, yeah, which, is, right. which is part of the reason that we're seeing these, uh, what I would call just the rise of intolerance yeah. on college campuses yeah. and uh, just this rejection of anything that uh, doesn't agree with, with the preconceived notion of uh, a power structure. And uh, uh, there's a lot of inconsistencies within that uh, uh, area of thinking, but I think that that also helps, helps explain the cancel culture. And at root, this is uh, what we're seeing at, at college campuses and with cancel culture and uh, sort of re reductionism uh, of identities is uh, extreme Ill illiberalism. Yeah, that's right. You know, the, the sort of master, master narrative, the, the top narrative of everything except liberalism is that you all are all children and that the state, the, the correct power, is your m mommy and daddy. And liberalism, what we're advocating, is adultism. It's the, it's the pleading with people, let's be adults. Let's not be envious. Let's not be angry. Let's cooperate. Let's have peace. Let's stop hating each other. You know, because all those, all those ideologies, those narratives that you mentioned, have an enemy. The bourgeoisie in Marxism. The Jews in, in classical German fascism. The, the immigrants for Donald Trump. Hatred is their, is, their, is their fuel. And especially when you talk about envy, yeah. it, it, there are some people that would say probably, yes, all this is good, but shouldn't we organize society to, to keep us safe from the force of envy and from envious people? So should we regulate or uh, organize ourselves in order to 
stop that well, but that, dark that's, force. But that's to indulge the envy. I think the adult way is to not be envious, is to, is to learn to be in a grown-up, in a free society, in which you don't say, oh, gee, look at you people understand both English and Spanish. Oh, uh, that's unfair. Why don't you all stop? Why don't you pound nails into your head until you forget English? I mean, come on. Th this is where the role of narrative or even ideology becomes very important. Yeah. Because, <clears throat> because um, take a country like Chile, yeah. which by any measure yeah. it was a success story based on increasing freedom, economic freedom, uh, political freedom, civil freedoms. Uh, it went from being a repressed society to, to becoming really one of the freest uh, countries in the world and also uh, became much richer and at the top of the league of virtually any indicator of human well-being in Latin America. And yet, uh, over the course of the past couple of decades, really, there was a narrative that predominated in Chile that said, um, this system is unfair. There is more inequality. There is no social mobility. The same people have benefited uh, from this system forever. The rest of us are being left behind. None of it was true. The, the, that is just factually incorrect. And yet, it is that ideology, that narrative, that somehow rooted itself in Chilean society to, to such an extent that there were uh, riots and even an election of a far left uh, government that promised to undo 30 years of, of those policies and institutions. Not because of the facts, but because of the narrative, because of the ideology, and because of the lack of liberals to go beyond defending the system, beyond uh, just making technical arguments about why when you lower the tariff rate, you're going to have an increase in growth by this m amount. P -p people don't care about that. They care about fairness. And if they are told and believe, and they only hear uh, that it is unfair, and there is not a defense of the free society and of the institutions that have actually made people freer and better off, you get what happened in, in, in Chile. So um, uh, I, I'm glad that it hasn't gone that far because uh, civil society in Chile that is liberal has uh, woken up and started making the correct counterclaims. Uh, they still have problems because of this ideological clash uh, exhibited by these varying different narratives. But the, that's right, the, the role of narrative and ideology, uh, they, that can play a big role in, in societies. It can happen in Spain, too, or in my country. Is envy one of the seven deadly sins? Yeah. <laughs> the reason yeah, why I ask that is because... Uh, it is. Uh, the reason why I ask that is because uh, um, I, I think that, to a very large extent, human beings have the ability to choose whether they are happy or not. And um, the, that choice depends which way you look. I'm here sitting right now. I can look backwards and compare myself with all the people who came before me and feel a sense of gratitude that I live in a Western uh, pro prosperous democracy uh, in 2024. Or I can look forward to a utopia that nobody has ever seen, uh, but some people have imagined. And I can be filled with resentment that I am not yet living in a world where everything is perfect for everyone, everywhere, at all times. And resentment, according to Nietzsche, is the worst of human emotions. Yeah. And it makes people very, very unhappy. Yeah. And so I'm always led to this um, uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful quote from a uh, British psychologist, uh, first name escapes me, Lyman, who says, always compare yourself to downwards. Don't compare yourself upwards. Yeah. Compare yourself to all the ancestors yeah. who are much poorer. Compare yourself to people living in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a five-year-old boy mining for lithium or something like that. Um, and suddenly you're just um, overjoyed that you, you are when you are, uh, yeah. that you are alive when you are. So compare yourself downwards, don't compare yourself upwards, because there's always going to be somebody who is going to be better looking, 
somebody who's going to be taller, somebody who's going to be more intelligent, that really kills me, um, <laughs> somebody who's going to be a better more tennis player. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a trap. And I don't see why we should be compromising the great liber liberal accomplishment just because some people cannot overcome uh, their f uh, pathologies and remain envious. What you're saying sounds like a tip uh, for avoiding uh, cognitive dissonance or the type of cognitive yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. dissonance that, that we see again and again um, yeah. working against uh, progress. Uh, do you have other tips? <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask my psychologist. He's, he's filled I'll with ask tips. my shrink. <laughs> but on, the, on that particular point, Shakespeare has a sonnet. One of Shakespeare's sonnets is about envy. Is that right? And he says, oh, I compare myself to other men, and I wish I had this man's fortune and this man's form. And then I think on thee, the person, the person he loves. And then I rank myself with kings. You know, so anyway, who love conquers all. This is interesting. In, in the Spanish Golden Age, uh, most of the now fam famous writers would also write against um, the deadly sins and, and against envy, yeah. of course. Um, and, 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 and pretty much uh, in, 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 in favor of what we would call now exchange of yeah, yeah. ideas and yeah. innovation. Yeah, yeah. Um, why do you think that this has not been the trend in literature or at least uh, well, over time? There's a great we have Spanish found. tradition of drama which carries on not just from the Golden Age but right into the 18th and early 19th century. There's an astonishing amount of playwrights in Spain. And in the late 18th century, they start talking in a pro-bourgeois way in their plays. And, by, and, 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 and Shakespeare did not. Shakespeare, though, it's a little uncertain whether Shakespeare was Shakespeare, but let's put that aside. <laughs> um, but if Shakespeare was Shakespeare, he was the son of a lower middle class or upper working class glover. <laughs> He was himself an entrepreneur in stage plays, but he wanted to be a member of the gentry. And in all his plays, he never praises the bourgeoisie. You get to Jane Austen, and it's changed. It changed very quickly in England in the 18th century, and it was starting to change in Spain. Can it be um, that the losers of innovation, um, uh, one of the questions is what to do with the losers? I mean, innovation might, might work uh, the in, in the big picture, but what happens with those who lose from Here's innovation? the trouble. You can't identify the losers. There are too many. Any change in society makes someone worse off. If you write a better book on the history of liberalism than I've written, I'm made worse off. We're in society. We bump into each other all the time. If, if Ian doesn't agree with me on something, or if he doesn't laugh at one of my jokes, you know, I'm going to call the police and make him laugh at the jokes. But that's the trouble. We're, 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 we're interconnected. So we can't make the decision on the basis of, well, the winners can compensate the losers. This is what we said in economics. It's nonsense. There are losers all the time. But, so we have to make the decision of what kind of society we want, so to speak, at a higher level. Do we want a society of, of, of adults who care for each other and take their responsibilities seriously and don't envy each other and don't hate each other? Is that the kind of society we want? Or do we want a society which uh, is encouraged by many politicians of hatred? I was just looking at a thing on the, on the BBC about the conflict between 
the Croats and the Serbians. And after Yugoslavia dissolved, the politicians found that they could, they could do well by saying, ah, yes, once we were Yugoslavs, South Slavs, now we're Serbian or we're Croatian, and we hate those Croatians. So we have to choose it not, at the, not in this cost-benefit way that economists operate, but in this more fundamental sense of what kind of people we want to live with. If perhaps I would just add that, um, uh, as uh, Deirdre's good friend Joel Mokia likes to say, all innovation is an act of rebellion, and all human progress comes sure. from innovation. And it is always in the interest of the status quo, be it religious, be it economic, whatever, uh, be it institutional, who want to suppress innovation in order yeah. to retain the rents they yep. receive from yep. Yep. their privileged position. Yeah, sure. So the key, the, the, the key to preserving innovation is to rely on that market mechanism within the international system, international competition. The ability to point to, uh, to, to countries that are doing well and to say, why can't we do the same? When I was a boy growing up in communist Czechoslovakia, it was very easy for us to point to West Germany and say, why can't we be as rich as the West Germans? Today, what is Millet doing? Millet is saying to his people, you used to be the fourth richest country in the world, maybe the second. Today, you are in 70th place. Wouldn't it be great if we could, uh, he's got an example, in other words. Or he could compare himself to Chile and say, look the progress that Chileans have made. Yeah. Spanish can compare themselves to well, who is doing well in Europe these days? Uh, <laughs> maybe the Swiss. You the tell Swiss. me. <laughs> and say, why can't we be more like them? Ireland. <laughs> Ireland. But the key is um, uh, to, to have this competition, be open-minded enough to learn from competition uh, and, and from other people's examples. Yeah. I think that's key um, for, for leaders in the world today. Yeah. You mentioned Millet. Um, so you... you, you, you I guess you have been observing uh, and trying to measure. It's probably too soon to, to, <coughs> to know how Argentina is going under Millet's uh, new policies, but uh, do you have any um, expectations? Look, they've been try they tried Juan Perón for 80 years. 80. Juan Perón. They, they tax you to give a subsidy to me. They tax me to give a subsidy to you, and we're both better off, yeah? <laughs> this is childish thinking, but that's what they've been told for 80 years. Millet has been president for six months. Come on. Let's give him a chance. That's right. I think that there's a lot of confusion in the international press about what he represents. We have seen the rise of the, the new right or the alternative right in a lot of countries in the world. You see it in Turkey or in Hungary, in the United States. It's represented by, by Trump. And these people have a lot of illiberal ideas, protectionism, a distrust of institutions, uh, of the free market itself. Uh, Hating GLBT people, say. And on and on. And that is not what uh, Millet stands for or says that he stands for or is that uh, reflected in the policies that he is promoting and that he has on the agenda for uh, Argentina. What he is trying to, to achieve is a limitation of power and an equal treatment under the law. This is a tall order for a country that has lived under the corporate estate of Peronism for 80 years and where those parents and that power structure is really entrenched. So it's going to be a very, very hard thing. We were talking about cultural change, and Deirdre has observed how in, in the past, culture can change very quickly from, yeah. from one uh, year to uh, the following yeah. years. Uh, and, and maybe it isn't deep cultural change, but it's sufficient, uh, sufficiently deep so as to make a difference. 
And I think that one of the things that's happening in Argentina, which Millet has introduced, isn't just the idea that there should be different policies, the idea that there, they sh there should be a radically different approach. He is promoting a paradigm shift uh, that uh, reverts the entire corporatist uh, status system in Argentina to be, to be replaced with the liberal system of a limited state. These are policy and institutional reforms that he's advocating, but beyond that, what he is possibly achieving, and certainly trying to achieve, is the kind of cultural change that would be supportive of those yeah. uh, policy and institutional changes. Yeah. That actually is brand new in Argentina. Yeah. And people today are talking about liberalism, the definition of liberty itself, which he says in virtually every speech, in a way that hasn't been true for 100 years yeah. in Argentina. Yeah. It just hasn't, it hasn't been true. Well, like I say, it's a tall order. We'll see, you know, it's, cultural change doesn't happen all at once. We'll see how successful he is. But I think that the role of any liberal is to support those ideas in a place that is struggling to achieve them. Here, here. And thank you, uh, Fundación Rafael del Pino, for this and many other wonderful uh, conversations and dialogues that they organize in their program. And thank you, Roger and Ediciones Deusto, for bringing us this marvelous book, uh, Superabundancia. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.